Hello everyone and welcome to the panel presents Comic Talk. Today we're going to catch up with what our guests are doing, we'll talk about our first life lessons that we learned from comics, and our top picks for our favorite sci-fi comics. It's all coming up next on Comic Talk. Hello everyone and welcome to Comic Talk, where we get together with a panel of guests to talk all about our favorite print medium. But before we start, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can get notified whenever we go live, because we have comic book related shows every Tuesday to Friday at 4pm on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch at Previews World. So with us today is the Duchess of Free Comic Book Day, Ashton Greenwood. Hey howdy hey, what's up guys? <laughs> And our special guest today from Top Cow Productions, please welcome Director of Operations, Henry Barajas, and President COO, Matt Hawkins. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing right now? Peachy. Good. <laughs> everyone surviving Peachy. so far? <laughs> yeah, no complaints. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get yeah, started. It's happening. All right. I think everyone's just trying to survive right now. <laughs> So let's talk yeah. about Top Cow. It launched in the early 90s with superhero comics like Cyber Force, but then in the mid 90s, Top Cow moved into a darker subsegment of the fantasy genre with titles like The Darkness and Witchblade. Years later, you'd have titles where that were more sci-fi based like Think Tank, Postal, and The Tithe. So Henry, with this wide range of titles, what would you say is the overall mission statement of Top Cow? I think uh, Matt would agree with me in saying that it's about making comics. Um, it's first and foremost a comic book publisher, and that's what's most important to us. And um, just telling a wide range of stories. I mean, the word Top Cow, it's such an awesome title that you could do anything with. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, possibilities with the kinds of comics and stories we can tell. You want me to chime in as well? Yeah, go uh, for I think, it. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think for the most part, um, Top Cow is one of the few publishing companies that's uh, run by Mark Svestri and myself. We're both creatives. I mean, Mark is an artist and writer, and I'm a writer. Uh, I just figured out I'd written over 600 books the other day, which was kind of a weird milestone. Yeah. But, um, and uh, I think, you know, we just like to do cool stories. You know, I mean, we like to develop and create cool characters and uh, tell stories that interest us uh, personally. I love the stories that require a lot of research. Like right now, I'm working on a uh, poaching project, um, and I've been researching all of that stuff down in Africa. It's it's uh, kind of heartbreaking, but uh, the research is a fun part for me and develops a lot of stories. And I get to use some of my science background for something. You know, it's nice nice to be able to use your education for something. <laughs> Very much. <laughs> Uh, and so that's that's actually a perfect segue, Matt. So not only have you been president C COO of Top Cow since 1998, but also been working with Image as a creator and writer for over 26 years. And so with 30 books under your ballot node, now you're saying 600. What title or titles have you worked on that you're particularly proud of? Uh, I think of all the work I've ever done, Think Tank and Postal are my two personal favorites. Um, I, I think Aphrodite 9 uh, with Seven Sage was, was, a, was a high mark for me career-wise. And uh, developing out the uh, sort of the slice of life romance titles with Sedgwick and his wife, Linda, has been uh, really interesting because uh, for most of my career, I've thought of myself as a science fiction writer. I never really wrote uh, superheroes. Um, and so when, when Sedgwick did Sunstone and uh, I started writing Swing and Sugar and some other projects, um, it, it's bizarre because writing romance, I got to tell you, I have a, uh, I have a newfound respect for the people that write that stuff. Cause it's, it's way hotter than I ever thought, way hot, harder than I ever thought it was. <laughs> and it, it's also way hotter. Pretty <laughs> and slip, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> My bad. No, that I was great. Good show. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> It fit perfectly. Now, Henry, now you've worked on a project that was pretty personal. Tell yeah. us about Tata -ta Rambo. It's a romantic comedy about my great grandfather. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really a, a slice of life story about my great grandfather, Ramon Abrigue. He co founded the La Voz de Mayo uh, organization. It translates to the voice of Mexican American Yaki others. He was a uh, Mexican American orphan, World War II veteran. And he helped um, the one of the last Native American tribes gain federal recognition. The pages that we're seeing now is me taking him to his last march to uh, to in protest of the um, border patrol and the 
police brutality <laughs> that they were uh, that was that the city was experiencing at the time. A woman named Rosa had uh, was a refugee and had to basically uh, seek asylum for uh, to avoid deportation and being split with her parent with her family. And um, that's where we start off, and we talk about the Native American history and Mexican American history that's uh, that makes the city of Tucson. And uh, I'm very, very glad that Matt was able to help me put that out. And for Diamond, uh, shipping out all these books. I mean, I just got word that the book is being used uh, for uh, a class at Cornell University. So there's just so many possibilities to tell this um, very uh, small story from a small uh, part of town. That's fantastic. I gotta say, uh Oh, I'm sorry. Can wow. I jump in on Henry's project? So I want to make one point. I, yeah. I, I have to say, um, I uh, when Henry came yes. on to Top Cow, he came on as a marketing guy, and uh, you know, and then he was pitching this, and he was doing Tata Rambo as a as a as a Kickstarter. It wasn't originally intended to be with us. And then when I really talked to him about the project and saw what it was, and realized sort of the significance, uh, you know, and we did this before all this insanity that's been happening of late, but. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of voices that have been squelched in this country for too long. And uh, this book is, I think, a good step. And I encourage everyone to read it. It's, it's a fantastic book uh, for for what I consider his freshman effort. I know he's done other projects, but uh, for his freshman effort, uh, I couldn't be more proud of you. He's out, Henry. Thanks, man. Aww. I love that. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and so Matt, coming back to you quickly, we're not in an here. Anymore, you know? <laughs> 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 Required niceness. Quarantine yeah. kindness. Quarantine kindness. <laughs> Quarantine kindness. I like that. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, thanks, Hector. Uh, oh, shout out to so Elena Salcedo about and uh, Vince. Switchblade because it's got. Oh. 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, so with that anniversary coming up, any special plans for it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're doing a uh, commemorative 25th anniversary edition where we're re-releasing the original Mike Turner one-shot, uh, or not one-shot, the first issue, the debut issue of Witchblade, and uh, that, that's exciting. We've dug up some uh, interesting covers. We've got going to be some... This will be a long-running uh, book that I think will be available in a variety of formats for through the rest of the year for us. Um, we also just recently started with the Witchblade Kickstarter, which was the 25th anniversary hardcover, uh, which I believe is available in stores now, both in soft cover and hard cover format. The uh, Kickstarter people should be receiving theirs. They're being shipped out now and over the next few weeks. It's been it's been a little tough because of uh, all the restrictions and everything going on, but. Um, no, we're doing some pins. Uh, Henry, do you want to talk about all the merch? You're the one that put all that together. <laughs> yeah, I um, was very uh, fortunate to have like helped celebrate the amazing series that is Witchblade. You know, a book that's made so many comic book fans and made you know things like Top Cow possible. Just going through the history, and it's there's so many passionate people. We did a Kickstarter. We had um, made some shirts that. Are I think we lost some audio. Let's see if we can get Henry back. Oh, okay. I thought that was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't hear Henry anymore. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so we there did we go. Pins, we did totes. Oh, okay. We did um, okay. uh, trading cards. We did so many amazing um, things. Thanks to all our Kickstarter contributors. I'm going to be uh, packaging and shipping um, rewards out tomorrow um, with Elena. So we are working on it daily. Yeah, we have a lot of other stuff that isn't not isn't announced yet. There's uh, there's some stuff that uh, we can't really get into just yet, but there's some exciting announcements regarding uh, which play in the Top Cow universe that we'll be revealing by the end of the year. Uh, we intended to announce some of this stuff already, but uh, you know, given everything, everything's sort of been pushed back about mm -hmm. six months in the world of themes. Yeah, that that's been happening a lot. But um, what else is going on on with yeah. Top Cow that? You you know, want people to know about. And also, Henry, if you wanted to throw in your uh, shout outs that you, you wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> shout out to Amanda Mungi, uh, number one, that's coming yeah. out on the 17th by Stephanie Phillips and Craig Cermak. If you like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, if you like, you know, Long John Silvers, I think a lot of Long John Silvers fans will really dig this book. But amazing um, Top Cow <laughs> Talent Hunt uh, runner uh, runner up winner. Uh, Stephanie, she um, 
she's uh, exploded. She is just is really all over the place, and we're happy to have uh, her new series with us. Yeah, man, Man Among Ye is another example of it. We've been running a Top Cow talent hunt for about uh, seven, eight years, uh, about every other year. It's not every year. And we've, we've brought in a lot of people, like Teeny Howard was uh, introduced to the comic book industry through our Top Cow talent hunt. Um, so was uh, Isaac Goodhart, who's now working on Catwoman over at DC. He did Postal with me and Brian Hill for, for a long period of time. So um, I think the Top Cow talent hunt, we just finished it. We just notified the winners. It hasn't been announced to the public yet. But we will be doing another talent hunt that will probably start sometime next spring or summer. Um, we can't – it's hard for us to do because we don't have a huge staff. So it's uh, Ryan, Katie, myself, and Henry, and Mark, and we're all looking at uh, just hundreds and hundreds of these uh, things, trying to find narrow them down to a, a winner and a runner-up. But, uh, you know, for the most part, we have uh, just a couple different lines of book. We have the Top Cow Universe, which is Witchblade, Darkness, and that stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that's going to be announced about all that in the coming months and year. Um to tie into things like the 25th anniversary of both, because next year is the 25th anniversary of the darkness. So um, it's got a nice two, two, three year kind of turn. Um, and we're also coming up on the 30th anniversary of cyber force. So we've got uh, a lot of milestones. It's uh, it, it's a little weird when I'm looking at, okay, I remember when those books came out and I was there, you know, I started at, at image at extreme in April of 93. So when uh, I see my names on books that are coming up on 30 years old, uh, it makes me feel a little old. But, you know, but kind of, well, you look younger you know, you know, than me, Matt. Come on. Oh, yeah? You're young at heart. <laughs> well, I try. You yeah, know. you look great. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm going to be 51 in a couple months. It's, it's kind no. Of yeah. No way. So, I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah. 69. I was born in 69, September 69. But, uh, um, and so, you know, I mean, we have the uh, Cedric books, which I write also in, and that's the Slice of Life Romance, that's Sunstone, Swing. Uh, we have uh, Sugar, and there's some new titles that we're going to be releasing in there. I think those books have been so well received because they're sort of uh, sex positive looks at these subcultures that uh, people are very passionate about. And uh, we've tried very hard, like with Sunstone, it's, it's, it's very authentic to that sort of community, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from uh, – you know, glad and, and, and all kinds of things on, on these projects. So we, we strive to make them, you know, because Fifty Shades of Grey was such a huge uh, success. But if you ask anyone actually in that SM community, they think it's a, it's a poor, uh, it's a poor indication of what their lifestyle <laughs> is actually like. They consider it very rapey. And, uh, you know, SM is all about consent and tolerance and fun and pleasure, you know. So I, I the rapey stuff doesn't work. <laughs> we also have so like Death to... Angel, Underworld, um, Bloodstain. We have a lot of cool um, titles coming out. There's so much uh, to come. And uh, yeah, uh, global pandemic will uh, slow us down, but uh, it, it won't take us out. So that's actually a perfect segue for the next question is, you know, with a lot of comic shops starting to open up again after this pandemic, uh, we want to get your take, each of you, on why you think it's important that people go out and support their local comic shops. Henry, you start. Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky that I get to work so um, closely with the local comic book stores. There's so many amazing people, like people that you just all walks of life, like physicists and like just people that are just in different communities and cultures that just bring people in to read comics and we have uh, something that we really um now value more than ever is the ability to to browse and you can't do that you can't really do that online there's just so much going on and just having a, a singular focus of just being at a comic book store looking at books on a shelf and seeing new books i mean every week it was like it was very painful for us to have no new comics out and i think um people are going to be really excited to go back and have that feeling again. Uh, comics is, is a lot of nostalgia. So um, I, my my comic book store in Tucson, Arizona, Charlie's Comics, gave me my first badge at San Diego Comic-Con, gave me a badge to go to Phoenix Comic-Con where I ended up meeting Matt Hawkins. Um, you know, comic book stores are the reason why I get to make comics. And um, it, it's one of the most important independent small book publishing thing that you could do. And just it, it, it's a greater impact of having um, vibrant readers in your immediate community. So it, it, there's so many different benefits. 
Yeah, I think the comic shops and the direct market are are, are vital to the long term survival of the comic book industry uh, in one format or, or another. I mean, they, I think there's going to be a lot of change in these things. And, uh, you know, everyone decried the end of the comic book direct market when digital sort of came out and it didn't happen. Uh, like I said, my entire career, I've heard from one person or another some amazing reason as to why the direct market and comic book shops would all be gone. Now, certainly we have fewer stores now than we did when I started, but the stores we have are amazing. You know, I I remember in the 90s, I would go to comic shops and I'd be like, how are these people even in business? You know, you go in, there's a lot of smoke <laughs> the aisles aren't very clear. <laughs> no one's there, you know, a guy smoking his pipe in the corner. And, uh, <laughs> That's not very conducive to to sales, and I think you know, you know that the biggest growth market we've had is uh, female readers through Amazon. I mean, that is, and that largely is is because I think of that slice of life romance category we're we're catering to. Um, but uh, no, we we've uh, you know, having said that, it's still vitally important to us for the to support the comic book stores. So I, I would encourage everyone, please. These are a lot of these are mom and pop shops. They're they're one or two or three people that work there and, and they've been there for a long time and their expertise and knowledge and passion for the industry uh, is going to be better than buying this, anything from Amazon at any time ever. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Well, you heard it from them. If you want to find, find out more information on top cow, you can find them at topcow.com or you can ask for their awesome titles at your friendly local comic shop where you might just find a new favorite comic book to read. And speaking of reading, let's check in on what our guests are reading or drawing or writing or watching or creating. It's time for What Are You Doing? So we want to ask each of our guests, what are you doing? We want to know... What are you doing to pass the time over the past few weeks? And to those watching, let us know in the comments what you're doing by using hashtag what are you doing? So let's start with you, Henry. Um, I've been riding my bike almost every day. That's been <laughs> one of the things that's keeping me sane. Um, I just finished uh, binge watching Mad Men too. That was uh, a painful week of watching 10 years flash by your eyes. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Mad Men is a good show, and it's and it's kind of funny yeah. that for you, Ashton, the little girl that's on the show is actually Sabrina on uh on the Sabrina right. the Chilling Adventures. Yeah, so it's kind of funny that she's oh, now like wow. eighteen that's years her? old and she's the little daughter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You watch this person grow up right in front of mm -hmm. you. It's amazing. <laughs> huh. It's cool. What about you, Matt? What are you up to? Uh, you know, it's just a uh, routine. I have, uh, my son just graduated from high school. So, uh, trying to help him, uh, you know, he seems more affected by the fact that he didn't get to walk and get to go to prom with his girlfriend. Uh, yeah, it makes me super sad, but he didn't, he doesn't seem to care. Uh, him and his friends have all been out uh, protesting almost every day for weeks and, uh, they all wearing masks. He's being social distancing, all that sort of stuff. But, uh, so, you know, working with my son, he, he's uh, starting college and working on some projects that he wants to develop. He's interested in being a writer and a creative as well. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to stay fit. It's hard when you're home eating all the time, you know. But uh, other than that, I'm working on the clock trade paperback. I'm working yeah. on Swing Volume 3. I'm working on this new poaching project. And I'm working on, honestly, five or six other things that I can't announce yet. I have uh, 600 pages of work in the queue. Kind of nuts. Wow. wow. That's always one of the things about this show is that there's always so many secrets that I want to know. Sorry. Well, some of the stuff is work for hire and right. I don't own it, so I can't announce it. You know what I mean? We understand. Mm -hmm. It still hurts a little bit. We understand. Sorry. What about you? What about right. you, Ashton? <laughs> okay, so Avatar update since I've been on here talking about Avatar <laughs> for like three weeks now. I... I'm almost done. I have four episodes left, so the entire like Sozin comic story arc, and Aang's gonna fight the Fire Lord, and Zuko's gonna fight Azula, and I have effectively partnered my my renewed obsession with going down the rabbit hole of Avatar fan fiction, which is quite the rabbit hole. And now I'm kind of like inspired between like everybody else's fan fiction and the rewatch. I'm like, do I want to write some fan fiction? Do I want to play in that sandbox? Because Avatar is such a fully realized world that it might be kind of fun. So I might be doing that. And then to what Henry said, I've been trying to walk every day, play tennis, get outside, stuff like that. 
<laughs> nice, that fan fiction world. I mean, a lot of writers come from there, so I think that was Fifty Shades of Grey, right? I Started might, off as a fan I might just like I might just like pull the trigger and do it. Right. Do it. Do it. You got you have Change other writers. Names. There you go. Saying do it. <laughs> All right, let's All move right, into our sold. next segment. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've got Ashton, let's move into our next segment first. You always remember your first. So anyone who... <laughs> it gets the guests every time. Wow. <laughs> so anyone who knows comics knows that fans really love their first issues and first appearances. So for first, we talk about some of the momentous comic book firsts that happened in our lives. For this episode, we want to ask, what was the first comic book that taught you a lesson? Or conversely, the first life lesson that you learned for a comic book? And for those of you watching, let us know in the comments what your first was by using hashtag first. So Matt, let's start with you. What was the first comic that taught me a life lesson? Um, mm -hmm. People hate it when I tell this story, but I didn't actually read comics until I started working in comics. So uh, for the first comics I ever read were all the first image comics titles. And then sort of I discovered other things. Um, you know, I really fell in love very early on with all of Alan Moore's work and reading V for Vendetta and all these things. I did learn that fascism is bad. That's a good lesson. That's a good, very good lesson. That's true. I mean, yeah, you learn that as soon as Captain America's punching Hitler, you know, one of the first pieces of comic book propaganda. Mm -hmm. And it's, right. you get these really cool life lessons. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ashton? What was your first life lesson? Yeah, so I'm going to make this kind of quick because Troy and I talked about this on Previews World. And I'm actually going to repeat my answer just because I, I, I liked it. Um, Do it verbatim. So I... I I, ooh, I feel like I made it kind of long-winded on previous world days, like someone <laughs> trying to make it a little more concise this time. Um, in the, okay, so I feel like I need to preface this with, it's an Archie answer because of course it is, because what else would I say? So in Archie number one, the relaunch run that Mark Quaid wrote, there's a story arc that's called like the lipstick incident, which is basically like Betty, at, Betty and Archie are dating at this point and Betty kind of gets, um, talked in to being like a, a girlier version and like dressing up and wearing, like, wearing makeup and like doing her hair and doing all these things for Archie that she wouldn't normally do. We bet he's like the girl next door, Tom boy type thing. So she goes through like all of these hoops to dress up for Archie to go out on a date and Archie kind of being the dumb dumb that he is tells her he's like, this isn't you. And he's a little brash about it. And of course he hurts her feelings because why wouldn't he? But the message is there, like what he's trying to say is important, his execution leaves a lot to be desired, but all of this is to say that it's important to be yourself, you don't need to be somebody else, everybody else has already taken that be yourself and to be unapologetically yourself, you don't have to be anybody else. Nice, very nice. And what about you, Henry? Um, get everything in writing, I think is the comic book. <laughs> I think it's talking about creative working. Sorry, not uh, not, not <laughs> That's um, a good one. I think one of the first that jump out to me was I was reading a Spider-Man comic where um, he's dealing with the overcrowded prison system, and um, that wasn't something no one ever talked to me about, and I was able to research on my own, and it took. Spider-Man going on David Letterman to yell about um, how overcrowded and horrible our prison system is and how it's predominantly people of color, black and Latino, and um, how it's just um, privatized slavery. And it's really interesting that that's, that's something I learned when I was like six years old. And that's, I think, why I'm still in comics, because I keep learning things from, every, from almost anything I, I read, because there's a lot of moral and just love and dedication to making a comic there, there's not a lot of money in this business so if you're making it you you really feel something about this um yeah that's that's a big one yeah i love how you know we we have like these traditional children's stories that we're always told to like read about or like stories from the bible and it's like you learn that kind of same stuff from comic books and you can reach kids from a really mm -hmm. young age and kind of get them into you know this this 
mindset of uh, openness and inclusivity. And um, I think that's something that comics has a great ability to do. Um, so so it's, it's nice to see that. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I was uh, lucky to have a teacher use mouse in high school. And we were able to learn about the Holocaust wow. because of comics. And I had never been so engaged in high yeah. school. So that was the goal to get my book, um, La Voz de Mayo, in schools and libraries so people can be, um, you know, can see a different side of history and have a, a visual engagement. Nice. Very nice. Wow, this is all such a deep, deep conversation that we're having. <laughs> but it's right. good. Sorry, it's I've, been, good. I've been talking to people in a couple <laughs> weeks. So I forgot how to do it. No, but it's all good. It's all important things that, you know, especially <laughs> right now, we all need to kind of, you know, look at and kind of read about and, and get into. Um, let's see. Do we have any responses from the audience? We do. Mike Clinton said, with great power comes great responsibility. Yes. Very, very true. Emblems and Capes said, I remember picking up Spider-Man Earth One and learning about weighing selflessness versus selfishness. Sometimes you have to set aside your dreams and do the right thing or the sensible thing. That's so true. Wow. Very, very true. Very true. Wow. That was a really deep um, first <laughs> segment. <laughs> <laughs> I know it started off with like the sexy first like video <laughs> and music. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's I'm great. So, yeah, I mean, we could tell those stories, but no one wants to hear that sad. Bring everyone down. Sad. Oh. <laughs> well, instead of making everyone sad, we'll just move on to our last segment, top picks. All right, for this round of top picks, we want to ask, what are your top sci-fi comics? And if you can let us know in the comments by using hashtag top picks. And we'll start with Ashen. What is your top pick? Oh, okay. So I have two things here that I kind of want to touch on. The first one is, of course, Undiscovered Country from Image Comics. I am obsessed with this book. I feel like I've been like on a crusade to get everyone to read this book since it came out. But it is it is really cool. It, it feels um, more topical than ever kind of right now. Uh, so basically, it, it is set in a futurist, futuristic, dystopian, isolationist America amid a panic. And there's a small team of people that kind of, you know, run the gamut from like an ex-soldier all to like a former American culture expert uh, and a doctor and a journalist and stuff like that. And so they all go into America. They're the first group of people to be in America uh, in 30 years since they closed their borders abruptly. And they're on a mission to find the cure for the virus, maybe not, figure out what this means for the rest of the world. And of course, once they're in there, America is not like what it was. It is a total Mad Max nightmare um, and variety of chaos ensues. So that one. And then also just as like a quick shout out to Dune House of Trades from Boom, which is not out yet. It's coming this fall. The date is TBD. I couldn't find it, but you know. We'll, we'll keep you updated on that on previous world. But so Boom is adapting uh, Dune's House of Trades prequel novel into a graphic novel. It's gonna well, it's gonna be a 12 issue miniseries, and it basically is the origin stories of Duncan Idaho, of you know the Trades, of Gurney, of um, Kynes, and of course Harkonnen. So I'm super excited for that. I just finished reading Dune for the first time earlier this year, so I'm extremely excited for that. <laughs> you have been a little dune crazy, but I'm excited for the movie too. It looks really <laughs> good. <laughs> what about you, Henry? What are your top sci-fi comics? Oh man, uh, there's so many. Um, Aphrodite Nine Rebirth by Matt Hawkins and Stephen Sedgwick <laughs> and Lord okay. of Earth. Thanks, man. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. Uh, no, I mean, I, I can spread the love. You know, Vault Comics, as she said, destroy. Oh, That's yeah. a cool sci-fi series um it was fun to do let's see um uh descender and ascender by oh, dustin right. Levin and jeff lemire i mean amazing books and she said destroy and there's a yeah i mean I, i'm so grateful that we get so many free comics that's one of the, the perks i guess mm -hmm. when you uh, don't get a retirement you have a lot of comics to build a house <laughs> with so <laughs> 
<laughs> and no, Ever 99 is fantastic. I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I know I, I love that project. Oh. I spent years working on it, but it uh, I just, you know, it's hard for me to think of it being someone's favorite sci-fi thing. I, just I like how, you know, I wrote it. I like how producer Johnny threw up some of my old cosplay photos from, I think it was like six years ago mm -hmm. in San Diego. Wow. Con, so. <laughs> Costume's great. Thanks. So yeah, personal favorite of mine. <laughs> what Me about you, Matt? Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I read so many and I, I think of, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do something a little self-serving. I'm going to, I'm going to pick two that, that we were involved with. I, I really like infinite dark that, uh, Ryan Katie did for top cow. Um, it's essentially about trying to escape the end of the universe, uh, in a spaceship, you know, and they end up in the, in the dark. It's, it's, it's a, it's a science fiction horror story, which you don't see a lot of. I've never tried one myself, but, uh, I, I really liked what he did with that. And then uh, I would say my personal favorite science fiction story that I did probably is called Stairway. And it's not a better known of one of my projects, but it is is it's the one that always uh, I think about all the time. And it was just a single original graph, graph novel that we launched as a Kickstarter. It's available in all the channels. And I'm not sure if we have a preview of it up on the site. Do we? Do we yes, we do. Of course. Okay, so if you go to topcow.com and free comics, you can read the first 20 pages of it. Um, but from other people, I, I do love Saga. I know it's it's kind of a given at this point. Um, it's 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 the best modern science fiction version of a Romeo and Juliet story I've seen, and uh, it's 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 kind of a, a it's it's a weird, oddly science fiction romance, which we don't get a lot of, and I think it's done it's done fabulous, obviously, but it's just such a great story, such great characters. Also, Eclipse oh, by Zach Kaplan and Giovanni Timpano, oh, yeah. Giovanni Timpano where the world is, uh, you get, it's, it's so hot that the sun burns people alive, so humanity is forced to become nocturnal mm -hmm. and becomes this really cool sci fi uh, crime noir. And uh, that's, that's uh, one, of my, one of my favorites. The trash truck is driving by my window. You might want to beat me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> That looks awesome, though. Very cool. I'm going to have to, like, write down all these titles. <laughs> Go get some of them. Right? Getting a lot of good recommendations. Mm hmm All right. Let's see what we have in the comments as well. The Michael is saying, my top sci-fi oh, comics, nice. the EC weird science fantasy line. Shout out yeah. to Michael Dooley, Eisner Judge. <laughs> Emblems and Capes. All-Star Superman. While Superman is at his most powerful, he's also at his most human. Superman has to deal with his own mortality mm -hmm. and not to mention a few wacky supervillains. All-Star Superman is definitely the most sci-fi that Superman has ever been. A always through the deuce machina, <laughs> ex machina, life-threatening illness, an interdimensional time-eating space monster, and so much more. Ooh, 100 bullets, says That's Tony Fenton. Pretty good. And then from Hector Gonzalez, we had Rodriguez III, we had a question from Matt. What is Top Cow doing for cultural relevancy and inclusiveness in titles, representation in books and talent, diversity, et cetera? Well, I, I uh, you know, Henry, I mean, you want to talk about this in terms of Lavaz and some of the other stuff we've done specifically? Because, I mean, that's that's what your book's all about. Yes. Uh, I'm living proof <laughs> that uh, we're doing amazing <laughs> and telling stories um, outside the box. I mean, La Voz de Mayo that deals with uh, Mexican American history and Native American history. We also have worked on a, an amazing series called Genius with uh, Mark Bernardin, uh, Adam Freeman, and uh, Afua. And that was one of the, like, I mean, to this day is still a relevant uh, comic that's about what's happening right now with the Black Lives Movement. It's about this uh, teenager who w wages war on LAPD. And, be, and is one of the greatest military minds of our time. And a lot of people will recognize Mark, Mark Bernardo's work on uh, Fat Man on Batman. Um, he's such a, he's working on a new Star Trek series. And um, yeah, it's it's such a relevant book. Um, it came out in 2008, now it's uh, 2020. And it's, if that book came out today, it'd be the same. You, you don't have to change a thing. Mm -hmm. Also Vindication by M.D. Marie. Um, another is a book about po police brutality and how a man that gets um, off on uh, false evidence, who's a black man, is is hunted by a cop to put him back behind bars. Uh, such a great um, series that, again, we put out today. Oh. And that was done by her brother. Um, 
a lot of influence on the black comic by uh, Jamal Eigel and um, and uh, Kwanzaa. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, with, of course, everybody has a long way to go. There's so many more stories to be told, and I'm glad that Top Cow is a place where you could do that. And uh, and I'm very honored that La Vosa Mayo is out there, literally going to be in hotels. Like, it's sold in Tucson, Arizona now, and going to be in um, in curriculum for high schools and universities. And I don't, I don't even have my college education. Like I don't even have a degree. Like my book has no business to be at a university. So um, I'm really um, proud of that. You lied on your resume, dude. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> it's a, joke. It's a complete lie. Everything is a lie. I'm, I'm the Don Draper uh, of comics. <laughs> just to jump in a little bit with uh, what Henry is saying is I, I actually do think that uh, we've done, we can do better, but we've done a reasonably good job, I think, of being inclusive and hiring uh, talent. But uh, we've done it more as a, a project-based thing. Like we look at projects like Vindication or Lavaz and various things and see how we can tell stories and, uh, you know, edu educate clandestinely while you entertain. And I think that's been a big goal of mine in terms of like Postal and Think Tank and the Tithe and these other projects I do. It's why I include in the back of everything I write a science class or some sort of uh, added value kind of thing. And I know I, I suggested that Henry do this as well. And he did such a fantastic job in the back of Lavaz because you can see sort of the cultural relevance uh, of his book because he includes, you know, letters and, and all kinds of links and, and stuff from and uh, newspaper articles. And it's really fascinating to read the story he wrote and then to read all the material that was available. Uh, around this that a lot of it is public record or stuff that Henry has tracked down interviews he's done um, I think there are a lot of really good stories that need to be told and uh, you know we're, we're open to anything I love that that's great I love how you guys really are, are so inclusive and really hitting a lot of things that are really important to talk about right now yeah so so it's so question, necessary that question was by Hector who had created a comic called El Peso Hero and he's on Telemundo, NPR, Reuters, uh, Forbes, cool. like that. Oh, wow. He can promote his book on, on a level that only like film and television can do. And, and he's uh, done such cool. a terrific mm -hmm. job getting his book out there mm -hmm. about a um, border fighting hero. And, you know, coming from a border town, mm -hmm. if I would have saw that as a kid, I would have been really, really uh, stoked. Mm -hmm. I Very love cool. that. Very cool. All right. Well, it looks like we're coming to the close of our show. But before we end, let's go around and do some plugs. Um, we'll start with you, Henry. Is there anything that you want to promote? And then where can people find you online? Um, they can find me on Twitter. Shout out to the uh, deputy turned sheriff crew. Uh, shout out to Ryan Katie. Um, here's some books that I've been reading. Safe, safe Sex, uh, The After Realm, and Isola. Amazing books. Um, I want to, you know, plug the um, the Last Dance documentary with Michael Jordan and the Bulls. You got to watch that. Um, you got to find me. You can find me on Twitter at Henry Barajas or at Top Cow Henry. Um, I'm also on Instagram uh, at Henry Barajas, and uh, you can get La Vos de Mayo uh, anywhere. You can get all our Top Cow series at topcow.com. We have uh, free comics, about 50 comics that you can read for free at this moment and go to your local comic book store. Um, of course, Amanda Mungi, number one, coming out this Wednesday. We got an awesome cover B by Stepan Sedgwick, who, um, yeah, you can pre-order it now at the topcowstore.com. And I personally and Elena Salcedo and Vince Valentine, we will personally ship these books to you so that you don't have to leave your home. It's contact free with Top Cow. We will never touch you. <laughs> Keep them busy. Ooh. <laughs> All right. What about you, Matt? Uh, I have a book called The Clock, uh, which was sort of shortchanged by the uh, shutdown. But uh, there's the trade, the collected edition, will be out in the fall. It's by me and Colleen Doran. It's oddly about a pandemic. It's about uh, a global eugenics conspiracy thriller of the weaponization of cancer that wipes out half the population. So it's 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 one of those family fun uh, stories. Um, but uh, that comes out in the fall, and uh, I've got Swing Volume 3 coming out in uh, also in the fall, which is the third volume of my uh, my romance, you know, epic that's doing so well. Uh, it is odd that that's my best-selling book, but it is by far. So, yeah, and Colleen Doran was nominated for an Eisner this year, so 
Yeah. She worked on the clock. And you can find me at uh, on Twitter. I'm at Top, Top Cow Matt on Instagram. I think I'm mhawk5222, although I don't use Instagram that much. But uh, Facebook, I'm self loathing narcissist. But you can just Google Matt Hawkins, Top Cow, Facebook, and it'll, it'll pop up if you, if you don't remember that. <laughs> self loathing narcissist. I like that one. <laughs> That's a long story. It uh, has to do with my uh, a brief story I had in internet dating. I'll, I'll, I'll save that for another day. <laughs> First. Oh man! <laughs> sounds like the sounds like the uh, start to a great romance comic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what about you, Ashton? You can find me online on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Free Comic Book Day. Uh, we will be hanging out, talking about comics, all that jazz. But we're also going to keep an ear to the ground on those social media accounts. We have an announcement forthcoming about the fate of Free Comic Book Day, and I'm dying to tell you guys, so you can find it there. Also, don't forget to check out Back the Comeback on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Um, you can join the social media challenge and shout out your local comic shop, tag five friends, challenge them to do the same, and we can all support local comic book and game stores as they begin reopening. And you can show your support in the utmost by going and purchasing however it's safe for you, if that means social distancing, if that means curbside pickup, if that means delivery, whatever you can do to show your shops some love because they need it right now. Perfect. Well, that about does it for Comic Talk. I want to thank all our guests for joining us. And we do this every Friday at 4 p.m., so be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can get notified whenever we go live. Also, tune in on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. for previews game night where we get together and play some games where you can join the audience and play along. And every Wednesday is Previews World Weekly, also at 4 p.m. And you can find out all about these shows by checking out Previews World on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. So, until next time, remember... Not all heroes wear capes, but right now there are a lot who have to wear masks. See ya.